Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you who are joining us from different parts of the world, which is quite a first because for the first time ever, the WTO Public Forum is allowing for public audience. And so we have all of you joining us from all over the world, which is fantastic. Um, Welcome to what is basically one of the very last session at this year's WTO Public Forum. Uh, my name is Diana Yahaya, and I am a feminist activist, researcher, um, organizer, as well as mobilizer based out of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And I'm being joined today by a panel of really esteemed speakers and fierce feminists as well as activists and researchers who I am extremely excited to hear from today. And I'm sure all of you who are joining us from wherever you are in the world today are very excited to hear from them as well. Um, just a bit of a quick background before we go into the speakers and I'll be inviting them and introducing one after before I call upon them. Um, this event is being organized by a number of organizations as well as coalition. Um, it's being organized by the Gender and Trade Coalition, uh, White Plus, the African Women Development and Communication Network, FemNet, the Women in Migration Network, WIMN, with the support of the Third World Network. And with the people and the steam panel of speaker I have with me today, I think we are going to be looking at some really, really interesting issues, um, especially given the context of the current COVID-19 pandemic. We are several, we're more than a year into the pandemic and the impact or the repercussion that we have seen around women all over the world and uh, is very, very stark. And so we're going to be having a discussion today and we're going to be hearing from the speakers today on what role and what is the impact of the current trade policies and how do we go forward with this current trade policies and this trade rule and these trade regimes which frankly speaking were one of the first to actually break down when this pandemic happened we saw all the global supply chains failing um, we also at the same time have been seeing for quite a while within the world trade organization or conversations around the trips waiver and so it's really a moment of time where i think we're looking at global multilateral spaces such as the wto and looking at what it actually means for women and especially women from these developing countries and developing countries in the global south. Um, so uh, we're going to be hearing from all of our speakers first today. Um, and then after we hear from each of our speakers, um, we're going to open the floor for all of you who are joining us on the WTO Public Forum. Uh, you are welcome to put in your questions, your comments, your feedback, um, and then we will be going to those questions as well as comments at the end of all the presentations uh, that we have today. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm going to jump straight into hearing from our speakers, because I know all of us are here and are excited to hear from them. Um, our first speaker in today's panel is Ambassador Solelua Mubi Peter, who is currently the ambassador and the permanent representative to the World Trade Organization um, for South Africa, as well as the permanent mission of South Africa to the United Nations and other international organizations in Geneva. She had previously served as the Deputy Director General for the International Trade and Economic Development at the Department of Trade and Industry, and she is responsible for managing South Africa's trade and investment policy development and was also responsible for leading South Africa's international negotiation on this matter at bilateral, regional and multilateral level at an official level since she joined the Department of Trade and industry in 2005. Ambassador, we're very happy to have you with us today. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Diana. And uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever uh, you are listening from. And of course, uh, I would also like to greet my fellow uh, panelists. Um, you have rightly indicated, uh, Diana, that we are meeting uh, at a time uh, when clearly we have um, the pandemic that is ravaging uh, the world. What is important is to ensure uh, that we are able to have a multilateral trading system uh, that responds to the needs of the current time. Um, we have seen that um, specifically in the context of this uh, pandemic, we have seen a situation where it is clear 
that the pandemic has showed us that it is not gender blind. Women are doing more domestic chores and family care than men, and they have been more likely to lose jobs than male counterparts. And sectors that employ a higher share of women have been especially affected by this crisis. A World Bank paper that has been released recently reveals that women-led businesses were disproportionately affected by the crisis with, compared to businesses uh, that are led by men. This is the case particularly for sectors that were hit hard by COVID-19, such as the hospitality industry, as well as a micro uh, business. We, of course, are aware that all of us uh, would need to um, support any initiative that must uh, integrate women-led enterprises in global trade. But we also need to be aware of the shortcomings of the rules-based multilateral trading system uh, uh, that is led by the WTO. The WTO is effectively a forum where members negotiate and agree upon non-discriminatory and facilitative rules that govern global trade. Therefore, none of the WTO agreements specifically focus on women's empowerment. The institution provides a transparent, uh, predictable environment which protects all businesses, of course, including uh, women-led businesses, uh, from the risk of uncertainty that would have been created if we had opaque or unpredictable uh, trade uh, rules. More uh, specifically, though, uh, we have seen uh, in the recent uh, past that a number of WTO members are increasingly introducing national trade policy interventions that seek to empower women. Between 2014 and 2018, almost 70% of all trade policy reviews reported at least one trade policy that is supporting women's economic empowerment. While legal commitments that members take at the WTO ensure predictability, I think we need to also um, recognize that there are inequities as well as imbalances in some of the existing multilateral trade rules that constrain the effective participation of women-led enterprises in global trade. Because what these uh, rules do is to lock in fast mover advantages, especially to key industrialized nations. For instance, we have some rules that diminish the possibility for technology transfer. They constrain the use of localization as a key policy tool for industrialization, or they limit uh, the policy space that is needed to nurture infant industries. Some allow uh, some countries to maintain trade distorting subsidies when it comes to agriculture, and this affects uh, food security and livelihoods for developing countries but also specifically women-led enterprises. Therefore, it is important that we address effectively these inherent imbalances in trade rules and ensure that the trade rules, and we do recognize the need for a rules-based open and fair multilateral trading system. What is important is to ensure that the rules are fair and they as ensure that everyone is able to effectively participate in global trade. And what that would mean is that we need to have rules uh, that will promote a technology transfer, especially in the context of a digital economy and e-commerce. This is a critical issue um, that is important to be addressed. Um, for women-led um, enterprises to thrive and to be effectively integrated in global trade, as I said, we must rebalance uh, the trade rules and reform the WTO uh, so that it promotes inclusivity and development. This necessitates uh, that we work towards trade rules that meet the objectives that are outlined in the Marrakesh Agreement. The Marrakesh Agreement uh, acknowledges that trade is not an end in itself and that global trade rules must be designed to raise standards of living, ensure full employment, and promote sustainable development. In relation to support for women-led enterprises at the international level, we believe that the ITC, uh, which is a key partner for the WTO and works directly with the business community on business aspects uh, of trade development, has an important role to play. 
The ITC has mainstreamed women's empowerment into its work uh, through the Women in Trade program that seeks to increase the participation of women entrepreneurs in global trade. For example, the ITC has the She Trades Initiative, uh, which seeks to galvanize global efforts to uh, connect um, about 1 million women entrepreneurs to markets. In addition, it has the Global Platform for Action on Sourcing from Women Vendors, which helps to connect a network of over 50,000 women vendors to partners who collectively purchase more than 1 trillion US dollars in goods and services. What this says to us is therefore that uh, we really need to focus our initiatives uh, on national policies, uh, which remain the cornerstone for promoting women enterprises and respond specifically to the constraints that are affected uh, or that constrain women uh, in terms of their effective participation in global trade. But of course, it also means that we must leverage the multilateral platforms such as the ITC to provide practical programs that will link women-led enterprises uh, to markets. We are, however, concerned with how women empowerment is sometimes raised in the WTO and what this would mean for a rules-based multilateral trading system. As I said, it operates on a non-discriminatory uh, basis. There is currently lack of clarity of scope and parameters of the discussion in terms of what we mean uh, in the context of a legally binding nature of WTO agreements that are subject to dispute settlement uh, processes, which we know um, uh, are not accessible to all members uh, for various reasons, including uh, the cost. We also believe that the critical issues to be addressed, uh, especially in the context of uh, the gender divide, is also in relation to digital trade that thrived during the pandemic. And without addressing the digital divide, legally binding rules on e-commerce will therefore work to, that, uh, to the disadvantage of women enterprises, especially those that are in developing countries. The priority must therefore, if we are serious about women empowerment, it would be to address uh, the digital divide. And if you are serious about integrating women-led enterprises, whether in e-commerce or the digital economy. Therefore, we believe that at, uh, in, in the form of developing countries, we need to have efforts uh, that should be made to preserve space within the domestic policies uh, for evolving data governance framework to promote digital industrialization. So as to support the building of local capabilities uh, to design as well as um, invent homegrown additive technologies uh, drawing from locally sourced uh, materials. And as I said, technology transfer has to be fundamental in the work of the WTO. And we do have a number of WTO agreements uh, that have technology transfer, including the TRIPS agreement. However, what we have seen is that um, there are no effective tools uh, within those agreements uh, to uh, truly ensure that uh, there is a technology transfer that goes uh, to developing countries. And these issues are quite critical. And we have seen this in the context of this pandemic where there is a, a discussion and a proposal that has been put forward by over uh, 64 members of the WTO and supported by over 100 members of the WTO for a TRIPS waiver so that we are able to diversify uh, production of key uh, COVID-19 related medical products and technologies so that we are able to uh, address the pandemic because we can see that there is um, vaccine inequity where some countries are able to vaccinate their populations while some are struggling to even get access to even one dose uh, for their own uh, populations. And this is a debate that is taking place uh, in the uh, WTO. What is therefore important is to have trade rules that respond to the needs of the people. And uh, if there are people who suffer the most as a result of this pandemic, it is women because um, of the care duties that I've referred to, they end up having to take care of the sick Sometimes it means um, leaving their jobs or they are taking care of their loved ones and sacrificing their livelihoods. Therefore, if we are serious about women empowerment, we need to ensure that the WTO rules assist us to respond to the challenges that we all face. 
So um, effectively, um, as I conclude, I think we need to find a way of reforming the multilateral trading system so that it promotes inclusive growth, inclusive development, as well as sustainable development, but as I said, responds to the needs uh, of the people. Um, it must therefore keep development at its core, including addressing the long promised development and needs of developing countries uh, that have been entailed in the Doha development agenda. Um, it must ensure that trade agreements provide the necessary flexibilities to achieve the developmental objectives, including supporting women um, on trade uh, through practical cooperation and that will uh, leverage the resources that we get out of the ITC to be able to provide that support to women to integrate into the global economy. Um, real empowerment of women can be achieved by delivering on the long outstanding issues, including dealing with asymmetries on agriculture, which are at the heart of the WTO. It also means preserving um, this, uh, uh, the key principles of the WTO, including special and differential treatment uh, to ensure that um, countries who are at different levels of development take commitments that are commensurate with their level of development. And they are not uh, forced to take commitments that will constrain uh, their uh, inclusive uh, growth. Um, we also need to have a WTO that delivers in the interest of people. And in this regard, we believe that MC12 uh, must have as an integral part uh, approval of the TRIPS waiver, which is critical to ensure that IP barriers are not a, a, a barrier to access to key life-saving uh, products and technologies. Let me stop there, Diana. Thank you so much, Ambassador, um, for your wonderful presentation and really giving us a bit of a, you know, perspective into what it does mean for someone who has been engaging with the WTO, within the WTO as, as a multilateral system um, and all of your experience within that. So thank you so much um, for sharing that with us. I'm going to go now to our next speaker. Uh, Gita Sen is an Indian feminist law scholar. She is a distinguished professor and director at the Ramalinga Swami Center on Equity and Social Determinants of Health at the Public Health Foundation of India. She is also an adjunct professor at Harvard University, a professor emeritus at the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, and the general coordinator of DAWN. Um, Gita, I will hand over the floor to you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Diana. And uh, I just want to uh, start with a little caveat. I uh, have ended my adjunct appointment at Harvard. Um, so just to clarify, that. I'm speaking today actually on behalf of DAWN. And DAWN stands for Development Alternatives with Women for a New Era, an organization, a South Feminist Network that has been in existence since 1984. DAWN is a member of the Gender and Trade Coalition, and we coordinate the Feminists for a People's Vaccine campaign together with the Third World Network. The objectives of the People's Vaccine Campaign include feminist concerns in the campaigns for vaccine equity and, and justice, and to bring feminist groups to the work on access to medicines. Um, we have a website that I would recommend to all of you. Um, it's feministforpeoplesvaccine.org, for as in the numeral four. Um, and there we have a range of resources, including issue papers, podcasts. It's a clear, simple, and people have said fun uh, website with cartoons and all sorts of fun stuff. And I would just recommend you right here and now to the first issue paper that we have there, which says, why should feminists care about access to medicines? Um, feminists should care because we're living through a time of what can only be called vaccine apartheid. Um, and coming right after Ambassador Peter, uh, I'm very aware of what that means historically. The idea of separate and unequal 
is so hardwired and baked hard into all structures of financialized globalization that's promoted by neoliberal economics. It affects how we live our lives. And sadly, during this pandemic, why and how more than 10,000 people are dying every day. Economic and gender inequality are completely intertwined and enmeshed in this system of apartheid. LDC, least developed country vaccination rates are under 3%, while we have in the high income countries boosters, third shots, and huge stockpiling and waste of vaccines going on. I'm reminded of the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. Um, all of us know that 50 million or around 50 million people died worldwide in that pandemic. But few of us know that 17 to 18 million of those people were just in India. And that was because of the colonial system of apartheid that functioned in India at that time. Within countries, gender and intersectional inequality are reinforced by neoliberal economic policies so that the poor women, people with disabilities, Dalits in my own country, African-Americans in the United States. Um, why have African-Americans in the richest country in the world died at double the rates of uh, white Americans? Sex workers, migrants, refugees, ethnic minorities, indigenous people, these are the people who are really worst affected by the kind of vaccine apartheid we're living through. Furthermore, in addition to all of the uh, aspects, uh, particularly the economic aspects that Ambassador Peters spoke about, we've seen a rising pandemic of violence against women. Girls school dropout rates have shot up um, and where girls remain in school, digital inequalities that are deeply gendered affect them severely, leading to early marriages and key health services for women have in fact been declining. Worst of all, women health workers who constitute more than 70% of frontline health workers and unpaid carers in homes are in fact extremely vulnerable to the effects of the pandemic. Neoliberal economic structures are built on and reinforce the toxic inequality that bedevils the dominant approach to the pandemic, including centrally, but not only, all aspects of access to medicines, be it vaccines, diagnostics, drugs, or personal protective equipment. And one of those structures is, as we know, the WTO itself. WTO, as we know, is nominally one country, one vote, but we all know that negotiating capacities vary and that this has huge impacts on people's health, especially of the most subordinate and marginalized. In fact, there are few safeguards for public health against corporate greed, which is built into the TRIPS requirements of the WTO. If we compare this to the pre-WTO prior system, um, we have a sobering reminder of what happened during the HIV, the height of the HIV epidemic, when antiretrovirals became available, but were only available in the North, while millions of people died in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Asia and Latin America. But that was the pre-TRIPS, pre-WTO time when it was possible, in fact, to break through that system to bring um, vaccines from India through via CIPLA to Africa at a fraction of the cost of what big pharmaceutical companies were wanting to charge for them. Now, those who believe that this is not the case with the WTO, I ask a variety of questions. What about the voluntary licensing by pharmaceutical companies? I would just say, we need to look at the numbers for that. Big Pharma is simply not voluntary licensing anything at the rates that we need. Well, what about compulsory licensing then? That is built into the TRIPS flexibilities. 
And I would recommend the, uh, our campaign's issue papers two and three that address this in great detail. Compulsory licensing only works for patents and works country by country in an extremely cumbersome and difficult way um, in the, and that is why compulsory licensing is absolutely not enough during this pandemic. Third question, wasn't COVAX set up to ensure vaccine access? Um, go to our issue paper number five. COVAX was set up to ensure vaccine access, but has been pitifully unable to do so. This year, for instance, 2 billion doses were supposed to be made available, and roughly only about a quarter of those have become available thus far. Is, but is there production capacity in the South? Bill Gates asked us in an interview very early last year during the pandemic. And we now know through a lot of work that's been done that of course production capacity is available. India was producing 60% of the world's vaccines even before this pandemic. South Africa has capacity. Bangladesh has capacity in its pharmaceutical industry. And a number of countries in the South actually have capacity if the TRIPS uh, clauses were in fact to be waived. And isn't the problem, and this is the last question, one of vaccine hesitancy Poor, poor people in this house just don't want the vaccines. They don't trust the vaccines. A recent paper in Nature um, provided hard evidence to show that in fact, it's not, there is very little vaccine hesitancy in the 10 countries that they looked at in the South. And there's much higher vaccine hesitancy in the US and Russia, which were the two countries that they looked at in addition to countries like Burkina Faso and others. The other problem with- uh, uh, Sorry, I can give you another 30 seconds to wrap up. Great, I'll wrap up. The again. other policies are IMF austerity policies. Over 150 countries, if we go by Isabel Ortiz's work, are being asked to implement austerity policies and there is differential treatment of the South versus the North, which means huge pressure on health systems and services in the middle of the pandemic. This neoliberal economics, I am now renaming as necroeconomics. It's an economics of obscene inequality and depth, and it matches the necropolitics of authoritarianism that is sweeping through many countries. Let me stop there. We have a number of asks that I will come to, including predominantly support for the TRIPS waiver that the ambassador spoke about in her talk, but I can come to those in um, the next round. Thank you, dear. Thank you so much, Gita. And I think thank you especially for really situating how the whole TRIPS waiver conversation is in fact and indeed both a feminist issue and a gender issue as well as a women's human rights issue. Um, and so now I'm going to go on to our next speaker we have on the panel, Michelle Rufaro Mazivisa. Michelle is a postdoctoral research fellow under the South African Research Chair under the South African Research Chair in the Multi-Level Government Law and Development at the Dalla Omar Institute for Constitutional Law, Governance and Human Rights at the University of the Western Cape. Her research focus includes the functions and power of provincial and local governments in the international trade and investment framework. She is an admitted attorney and a member of the African Feminist and Development Network, FEMNET. Uh, Michelle? I will hand over the mic to you. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, I'm also just going to add that uh, Feminet is also a co-chair of the Gender and Trade Coalition, and we're excited to be in this conversation. So many thanks um, also to the WTO uh, for organizing the public forum. So I'm going to pose three questions uh, in my discussion today. The first is, what is trade? The second, what are the developments in trade and agriculture? And the third, where exactly do women fit in? So international trade is the exchange of goods and services across borders. 
It is guided by a spaghetti bowl of legal rules, primarily under the WTO, which connects 164 member states as adduced by the ambassador. The WTO operates on two key principles of non-discrimination. However, it allows its member states to enter into preferential trade agreements. And this has resulted in numerous and intersecting agreements over the years. What are the developments on trade in agriculture? Agriculture generates approximately 100 billion US dollars or 15% of the African continental GDP annually. This ranges from plus or minus 2% in South Africa to about 35% in Mali. And agriculture is a critical sector for food security, employment and export trade. We are yet to see if the African Continental Free Trade Agreement will increase intra-African trade in agriculture through tariff, tariff elimination. Now back to the WTO. The Uruguay round sought to extend trade negotiations and to revisit outstanding issues such as agriculture. Article 20 of the Agreement on Agriculture had built in commitments to reopen negotiations on agriculture. And these negotiations started in 2000 and were incorporated into the Doha agenda in 2001. Later, the 10th Ministerial Conference in 2015 in Nairobi dealt with export competition, public stock holding, special safeguard mechanism and domestic support and market access, which are still issues on the agenda. In terms of export competition, the ministerial decision on export competition requires developed countries to stop export subsidies, except for a few products, while developing countries had until 2018, but can cover transport and marketing costs until the 2023 cutoff date. However, export finance, food aid, and state entities' agricultural exports can continue to be used to support agriculture and somewhat bypass the export subsidies rules provided that member states limit the trade distorting effects of these measures. Public stock holding is a legitimate pol uh, policy issue, especially important looking back at the negative impacts of the COVID-19 on global supply chains, but it can distort trade if prices are fixed by government. The G33 group of developing countries proposes to include public stock holding under the green box list of allowed domestic support measures that have a minimum trade distortion or to exclude them from the AMS calculation. However, some argue that it is more than minimum distortion and may risk food security in other countries. So this is still obviously a contentious issue. In terms of special safeguard mechanisms, the G33 is advocating for flexible SSM, which allows developing countries to use it as a trade remedy to manage price volatility risks and to balance trade distortions. However, others want stricter rules on SSM to prevent trade distortion, while some are concerned that it may affect their exports. It is still debated also which products could be covered and what would be the duration of the SSM if applied and the link between that and market access. In relation to domestic support and market access, these are still very much on the agenda and there are strong disagreements on the way forward. There are different types of domestic support categorized as amber, blue, and green box, as well as the development box. So where do, where do women fit in? History has taught us that the actions of non-state actors, such as businesses, can result in violations of human rights and although they are not directly obliged to protect or fulfill human rights, they are required to at the very least respect human rights, including women's rights. While the majority of trade agreements, excuse me, are framed in a gender neutral way, evidence is pointing to the fact that women are affected by trade differently from men. And this calls for more engagement with the concept of gender and trade. Subsidies have gendered employment effects. Gender segregation in production may be reinforced by reintroduction of public stock holding. Increasingly, we see men taking, taking over previously female dominated sectors when production shifts from subsistence to commercial farming, for example. We can look at Kenya uh, in the 1980s as the European market for vegetables expanded, women's traditional domain of horticulture was appropriated by men. We also know and have seen increasingly during this time of the pandemic that women are vulnerable on all levels of food insecurity. The UN World Food Programme predicts that 
over 270 million people will be at risk of food insecurity in 2021 and 41 million at the brink of famine. WTO members must, and I quote, uh, aim to correct and prevent trade restrictions and distortions in world agricultural markets as advanced in the SDG2. In other words, international trade is important for building sustainable food systems and can promote food availability and access through strategic global supply chains and job creation, respectively. Food security can reduce the risk of transactional sex and women staying in abusive relationships due to financial dependence. The patenting of seeds um, for example, is also pushing women out of their traditional role as custodians of seed and compromising food security, especially in rural areas in Africa. Another issue is unequal land ownership, a crucial factor of production, which continues to prevent African women from fully benefiting from trade. The gender digital gap hinders women's access to markets, which is especially unacceptable in light of the COVID pandemic, which has made electronic commerce more prominent. Agricultural production is often based on informal seasonal work that is low paid and thus while promoting employment, it encourages precarious working conditions, which put women at risk of low income and job insecurity. Special safeguard measures can, during import surges and price declines, can help protect state revenue available for public services that would otherwise be subsidized by women through unpaid care and reproductive work and women's sexual and reproductive health services, which are usually the first to be reprioritized in cases of emergency, as we are seeing during the COVID pandemic. Women's health is often risked in agricultural processes such as farming by using chemicals, fertilizers, and pesticides, which are harmful to women's physical and reproductive health and are often used in these processes. And finally, Diana, <clears throat> Special and differential treatment, especially for agricultural commitments, is, Im is imperative to allow domestic policy that supports women's empowerment. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle, uh, for your presentation just now. I'm going to now invite our next speaker, Sofia Scacera. Sofia is an associate researcher with the Transnational Institute, TNI, and specializes on digital economy, labor, and development. She's a researcher at the World Labor Institute at Universidad Nacional 3 de Febrero, UNTREF, in Argentina. She is also advisor to the International Trade Union Movement and in the Argentine Senate. Sofia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Diana, a lot. Uh, I am really honored that I got invited. Thank you so much for this great panel and these great uh, female voices that are rising to really try to understand the trading system with a gender perspective. Um, what I wanted to deliver here in these few minutes that I have, it's the fact that we learned so far that the trading system has been unequal with women. We already know that there's a lot of evidence around that. We know how women are impacted all around the world by the trade rules. And there's a lot of studies done by UNCTAD and, and other uh, institutions which actually show the impacts of women as consumers, as producers, as workers, and, and as citizens. And, and we have seen how those impacts are unequal. And there's a specific study that I want to point out that it's a, a study made by Tejani and Milberg, which says that uh, whenever a, a, a product becomes uh, exportable and it, it's open up to the market, women tend to leave that place in Latin America, at least, um, lead to tend to leave that sector, and they focus on um, on, on internal market driven products, and the export are done by men mainly because uh, they are higher salary, they have higher higher salaries, and they can earn in dollars. That's uh, something that they studied in Latin America. At least, it's not the same for other regions of the world like Africa or Asia. Yeah. Uh, where women are used to lower costs and they are used as uh, to make a dumping between countries when they export products. Now, the world is shifting to services now. And we, we know because of digital technologies how the services are starting to be exported and imported around the world with a, a, a velocity and, 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 and a, 
uh, a volume we have never seen before. The truth is that digital technologies open up to uh, um, export new digital services all around the world, and the 5G networks are going to reinforce that. Um, we are going to be able to uh, export different services through 5G networks, offering, for example, uh, recommendations uh, in smart houses or the support for the smart houses or in health, for example, or in, in, in education. There's a lot of sectors that will be impacted by 5G networks and a new way of services that are going to be exported. Most of those services are highly feminized, like health, like education. They are services that are highly feminized and they have a lot of women in working inside those markets. And they are going to start becoming exportable little by little once the technology advances. Now, if we know something that we have learned so far is that technology is not gender neutral. We cannot say that technology is gender neutral. I have heard this phrase over and over and over again in many panels and in many places talking about how the technology is gender neutral and therefore is the great equalizer. And I must say that, for example, if I use the washing machine, machine in my house, well, it's gender neutral. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if the washing machine is turned, uh, it's, it's put by my, my colleague or by me. It works exactly the same. But the fact is that you cannot say that a washing machine is the great equalizer just because of that, because other things have to happen. And with technology happens the same. And we have a huge digital divide among the world. And it's not the same that the access that we have to technology throughout men and women, and not only the access that we have to technology, but also the uses that we do of technology are somewhat different. We have not the same skills using the technology between men and women women, especially on the global south. So what can we expect of these new uh, exports that are going to start um, affecting services that are highly feminized, for example, in health and in education or in commerce, in trade? Uh, we, we, what we can expect if we have learned from the lessons in the past is that women are going to start focusing on internal markets and the exports are going to be left uh, to the men. So women will be displaced from those sectors, leaving them without a job or having to compete in the international markets, maybe without the proper skills that they have or the proper access to technology to make a, a, really, serve, a really good service being delivered across the world. So what, I, what I, I, I'm thinking about is that to solve all these, these issues, we need more state. We need a state that is present. We need public policy. We need to breach the digital divide. And among all, we need more education and more access to women to export in, in other markets. And for that, we need a strong state with finance and with um, uh, the, the, the capacity and the sovereignty to make public policies. And the, the rules that are being negotiated at the WTO, especially on digital trade, they go on the same directions of the rules that we had in the past that caused all the inequalities that we already had. And they are trying to make a neoliberal digital capitalism without rules and without taxes. Um, and they put handcuffs on the states capacity to regulate and shape the markets inside the market. So for example, if I want to uh, uh, promote digital industrialization in a local company because it has a gender balance and because they're working on those agendas, that will be much complicated for a state because they can say that you are preferring a local company among a multinational company. Or for example, the principle of prior authorization to prevent to come for companies to come into your country if they don't uh, uh, comply with gender balance or, or they are not uh, making um, technological transfers inside the country. So there's a lot of reasons why we need uh, to leave the state the capacity to do public policy in order to change this reality. Because if we uh, look at the lessons we learned in the past in trade and in technology, and we look what the future is bringing after this COVID crisis and how the services market is changing, what we will have is more inequality, a more a bigger divide, gender divide across the world and across the global south and the globe and the north. And so what I'm trying to say here is that prevent from signing free uh, um, trade agreements first 
uh, really try to focus on what the states need to make this bridge and to uh, solve these problems of the future, problems that we haven't faced yet because we don't have 5G networks yet, for example, and, and then regulate at the international level. But first, leave the, the policy space, do not put handcuffs on the states and be able to regulate in order to bridge the digital divide and to uh, reach the five, uh, the fifth um, uh, development goal of the United Nations, which is, um, which is equality between uh, men and women. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sophia, um, for your presentation just now. We actually do have a couple of questions um, from our audience. Um, and there's a there's one that's actually directed to the ambassador. Um, and it's specifically around the joint special initiative around the WTO's Women's Economic Empowerment Work. Um, and I'm actually also going to pose a similar question. So I'm going to ask the ambassador to speak from your point of view um, about why the well, South Africa has not participated in the JSI on gender and trade. Um, and then I'm actually going to invite Michelle, Gita, as well as Sophia. Um, Michelle, yourself and myself being both part of the Gender and Trade Coalition. Um, what is the perspective of a lot of feminist civil society organizations on that point? And then to Sophia, the how the gender and trade declaration really mentions e-commerce as a key area for women's empowerment and trade and so i would like to hear from you on that as well so we're going to start off with the ambassador first um and so again to the ambassador the question is why has south africa not participated in the jsi on gender and trade and what are some of the concerns that south africa has um, regarding that um, thank you very much, Tiana. Uh, South Africa is not a participant on any of the JSIs, uh, including the JSIs uh, on women empowerment. The reason uh, behind that is that we believe that uh, there is the Doha development round that is supposed to deliver real development uh, to women. As we heard also from Michelle, there are lots of outstanding issues that will make a real contribution to the empowerment of women if we address the existing imbalances in the uh, multilateral trading rules. Whether you are talking agriculture, whether you are talking uh, the trims, whether you are talking um, other related agreements in the WTO. And as such, we believe that uh, there is a multilaterally mandated work and issues that have been agreed by all members that should be the focus of the WTO. When we look uh, at the JSI on women empowerment, that South Africa is the strongest advocate on women empowerment. Um, this is visible also in terms of uh, uh, whether you're looking at cabinet, we also have um, affirmative action as a policy that aims to open up opportunities, given the history of discrimination in South Africa, including issues related to inequality that includes um, participation of women in the economy. So we are fully committed uh, to empowering uh, women. But what is important is to look at what this means in the context of the WTO, knowing what the WTO is and what the WTO is supposed to do. As I said, when you look at the WTO, it's about non-discriminatory rules and the principles of MFN and non-discrimination. And the question that we have been asking to the proponents of the JSI is the scope and what is it that we are trying to do with this initiative? And I think even if you speak to the members that are party uh, to uh, the JSI, it's not clear what they are trying to do, other than, of course, trying to be seen to be doing something uh, around women empowerment. And for us, we don't believe that is the right approach. We believe in addressing the real challenges that women uh, face. And, one of those is something that has been raised uh, by Sophia, that uh, what is also important is to look at whether we have rules that constrain the support, real support that women need at a national level. So the issue of policy space is critical. Then the issue of nurturing women-led enterprises, the issue of dealing with digital divide, the issue of ensuring 
that developing countries have access to policy tools that will really empower women at the national level. So for us, those are the types of issues that are critical, including, uh, as I said, uh, the issue around addressing this very pandemic. So when you look at the role and, and voice of South Africa in the WTO, it's about addressing the real issues that will ensure that we meet the uh, goals that we've set for ourselves in the Marrakesh Agreement, which is about and living standards, which is about full employment, which includes also um, ensuring that we address the inequities uh, that are there in the multilateral trading system. Uh, thank you. Thanks, yeah. yeah, and so going from the ambassador, um, and we've heard what were some of the concerns or the perspective of South Africa on this, I'm going to go to our three other speakers. Um, and I'm going to start with, uh, with Sophia. Um, because there was one question that is also in the link to that, um, of course, part of the JSI, the JSI follows the work of the Gender and Trade um, Declaration from Buenos Aires um, a couple of years back. And one of the key aspect of that declaration was that mention of the e-commerce as a key trade or sort of a key area for women's empowerment or economic empowerment or women's participation in trade. So what do you think of that? Do you think that's true, given some of those constraints that you were mentioning earlier in your presentation as well? Well, the truth is that uh, once the declaration uh, uh, was launched, also more than 200 feminist organizations launched a declaration saying that that was a scam, that that declaration did not reflect the, the views of women uh, around the e-commerce agenda. And the truth is that if you look at the e-commerce agenda, it will affect women greatly. First of all, because it doesn't allow the disclosure of the algorithms. And we know that algorithms have been severe with women. Uh, discriminating them. We, we have uh, cases that show this, for example, the case of Amazon in Germany and how an algorithm discriminated against women. And so we don't need more evidence than the evidence we already have to know that algorithms discriminate against women. And this is a huge problem. And for example, the e-commerce agenda doesn't allow us to do audit of those algorithms. But not only that, also they tend to say that e-commerce is great for women because you can export goods and because you can, uh, you are in Africa in some country and you can export your products to China or to United States. And that's not even true because as I said, the digital divide acts a lot and, and those women generally do not have access to, to technology. Some of them have, but all, as usually happens, the one who have access to that technology and that can really breach the language problems and can breach all the problems that they have in order to export are women with high educational level and not the common women, the, 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 the grassroots women, that the, the general population of the women across the world. So what we are seeing is that if, if uh, we don't put um, national rules in e-commerce in and we don't start charging taxes and shaping the markets, what we're going to have is an e-commerce agenda that will benefit women in the north, in the, in the richer countries, uh, against the, the women in the global south. And that will uh, uh, um, uh, gap in even more the digital divide and even more the, the gender divide that we have across the world. So actually, it's not like that. The, the uh, e-commerce agenda that there, it's been negotiated at the WTO, it's the other way around. It will affect women in a way that we have never seen before. And we are creating a digital future that will only bring more inequality into the, the, the digital arena and the, the, the years to come. So no, I don't think it's true. And I think uh, it's really problematic that a lot of countries sign on to that declaration without asking themselves really what the e-commerce agenda is about for women. Thank you so much, Sofia. Gita, I'll go to you and I wanted to hear from you and then after this, Michelle as well, about what are your, what are your thoughts specifically to that declaration from a feminist and from a movement perspective um, from the Global South. Go ahead. Um, sure. Um, one of the earliest um, things that we understood when Dawn began its work, which is now decades ago, is that um, there can be no gender equality um, without a larger, more, and uh, an environment of structural structures and systems of justice and equality whether it's economics or, or politics or in society, 
at large. Um, and we um, used to make the argument in those days saying, you know, you want, if you keep focusing on gender equality as equality between men and women, and this is not about the binary issue, it is about it taking, penning it very narrowly within that context. Um, it's like asking for an equal share of a poisoned pie. We believe that the WTO is in fact a at by now, it has shown itself to be a pretty poisonous system of uh, uh, the trade of how it uh, uh, how the trade pie, in fact, is sitting with us. And so we don't believe that this kind of it will help women as much as it helps everybody else if we address gender within a larger, more just system. And if we get, for, for example, the a waiver on, uh, the, uh, on the TRIPS clauses in relation to public health uh, for, uh, for this pandemic, if not longer, then that will in fact set the terms within which we can talk about whether women get better access to vaccines and to um, diagnostics and drugs and equipment. Um, on an equal footing with everybody else. If we don't include that kind of structural change, and I don't see it in this declaration in any serious way, I see it as just being tinkering at the edges, and I don't think it will do for women what it is that it claims to be wanting to do. Thank you, Gita. Michelle, what about you? Thank you very much, um, Diana. Uh, I think the ladies have already responded, but I will just add a, a few pointers from my side. We, we know that um, the current uh, system promotes a neoliberal model of economic competitiveness and growth, which is based on trade, uh, on free trade and you know, reducing states' intervention in how businesses conduct um, their operations. And one of the things that is at the root of this is that businesses operate for a profit. That's the primary objective for most um, businesses, well, ex excluding nonprofits, of course. <laughs> but the fact that these businesses exist in a system that promotes free trade and that they are pre-existing patriarchal systems that have positioned women, especially women living in poverty, as a source of exploitable, low-cost labor. Um, and also because of gender gaps in education, women continue to work in low-skilled jobs, unlike men, even in the agricultural sector. So you find that transnational corporations operate in these global trains. These, um, global value chains are regulated by a free trade system and they rely on women's low cost labor to enhance their comparative comparative advantage so the benefits of trade will not always translate to the women it will not always translate to the people on the ground and so it becomes a beneficial system for the large transnational corporations without trickling down to the masses there is also a move to include gender clauses and provisions in um trade agreements. But the problem is often that these agreements usually only use the words women and gender, if at all, they use them super superficially without going into the details of exactly how the agreements will put women on an equal footing. And there's not enough disaggregated data on the impacts of trade and um, on women. So even as we're looking forward to the African Continental Agreement that's working on a, a gender protocol, there, these factors have to be taken into account. But if these negotiations happen beyond, behind closed doors and women's organizations don't have access, then we can't input into this conversation in a meaningful way. I think that's all I can add for now. Back to you. Thank you so much, Michelle. And thank you so much to all the speakers. Unfortunately, we are at the end and we're running out of time um, for our session today. But I think uh, I'm sure as many of the audience and the participants in the room, um, virtual room are with me today. Um, there was so much takeaways and so much learning that I had from so many of the speakers today on so many different areas. And I think it's really exciting and such a privilege and honor to host this space um, with such amazing 
group of women here um, this evening. And I think I just kind of want to add and sort of like wrap up also just by saying that there was actually one last question which wasn't directly posed, but I think all the speakers throughout their presentations and in the actual responses they had just now as well, did spoke to and that was really on the questions of why we don't see any research from the world trade organization that raises all of these critical questions which is so ironic because all of the speakers we had here today we were talking about these those exact same research or critical research that has been carried out by the women's rights organizations and movements for basically as Gita mentioned several decades already um and yet you know we don't see any of that same critique as well as analysis coming out of the World Trade Organizations. And so it's certainly not an issue where there are not enough evidence-based experiences and research being done on the ground, because as we've clearly heard today, there are plenty of that already around. Um, and then that brings to the next part of that question, which is that the WTO believe that trade liberalization has only positive impacts on all, including women. And I think perhaps um, a lot of the presentation that, that came earlier and I think Michelle's last point and how we are living in a neoliberal system and that's the predominant economic system and we assume that that is the only economic system that we have and that we can live in and that that system um, does not necessarily suit, serves the interests of the large majority of the world's population and particularly women. So I think as we mentioned at the very beginning when we opened the session we are living at a very peculiar and particular moment of time of, of history at this intersection or junction of multiple intersecting crisis and a question of like where do we go from here um, where do we go from here for the, for women around the world where do we go from here for the planet and so i think it's been a really really enriching conversation there are certainly a lot of work that has already been done um, and i'm sure there is a lot more work that will continue going ahead um, as we continue to both grapple with this current pandemic and think of ways that this current multilateral system uh, the trade the world trade organizations and the other multilateral system can best served the interests of the large majority of the world's population and especially women. So I want to thank all of our speakers once again for joining us. It's pretty, it's either really early for some of you or it's quite late for some of you, um, including myself. But thank you again, all of you for joining us. Thank you to all the participants um, on behalf of all of the organizers of this event, which is the Gender and Trade Coalition, White Plus, Femnet, WIMN as well as Third World Network. We're really, really happy to have all of you join us today and we look forward to having this ongoing conversation on how we can bring justice as well as equality to all the women around the world. So thank you so much for joining us and have a good rest of the day, good evening, good weekend to all of you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, dear. And um, thank you, everybody. Michelle, Ambassador, Sophia, great to be with you all here. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye.